There's a line that um, is often used, on my own, I can go faster, but together we can go further. And there's some truth in that. But if I'm going to be traveling somebody, I want to be traveling with somebody uh, who's fast. If I'm in a relay race, I want to be in a relay race with somebody who's fast. You know, as, as a young boy, when I was a boy scout for a while, you know, we'd do a lot of hiking and they'd ram into us the rule that, um, you know, you go at the pace of its slowest member. And uh, that's really useful when you're hiking because you don't want to leave anybody behind. And in the church, we don't want to leave anybody behind either. But in the church, we don't move at the pace of the slowest member because then guarantee you will never go anywhere. Um, in the desert, uh, Moses didn't go at the pace of the slowest Israelite. He went at the pace of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And we have to travel uh, at the pace and in the direction that the Lord's leading us. And sometimes that's a pace that's faster than we would like. But we've got to be um, those people who follow Jesus well. And uh, there's an acronym, and the reason I use the word fast is an acronym that's often used. Uh, Will Murray uh, has used it many times, and it stands for faithful, available, submissive, and teachable. And as deacons, we've got to be faithful people. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul writing to Timothy says, things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And Paul understood a key principle here that um, the message that he had, the vision that he had, uh, the job that he had, he couldn't do alone. He required other people, but he had to entrust faithful people with that, reliable people with that. There were many people who heard, who heard the message, but some of them were faithful. Some of them were reliable. You know, uh, before COVID, I, I would travel often and sometimes I'd be overseas for three, four weeks at a time. And when I was, I was aware that a friend of mine, uh, Philip van der Vestes and his family were battling with one car um, and sometimes it was very difficult. So I'd say to him, hey, Phil, while I'm overseas, would you like to make use of my car? And the reason I was, I was able to do that wasn't because I'm incredibly generous. It's because Phil is always incredibly faithful. That which was valuable to me, my car, I knew that if I put it in his hands, it would not be neglected. It would not be abused. Uh, and whenever it came back to me from Phil, it would come back cleaner, in better condition, and with more fuel in it. So it actually paid me to entrust my car to him for those three weeks. And in a sense, the message that Jesus has, he entrusts to men, and we've got to be faithful with that. And the message that we have as elders, we've got to entrust it to others because this is a team game. And so are you faithful? And then are you available? Uh, there's a famous story once of uh, uh, Dudley Daniel who led the NCMI uh, apostolic team. He formed uh, an elder in a church and he said, I'm going somewhere on an important trip. Will you come with me? And the guy said to him, let me pray about it and get back to you. And uh, Dudley's response was, no, don't worry, I need somebody who's ready now. And that may seem a bit harsh. And yes, we've got to, we've got to be, be obedient to the Lord. But I th think our default should be that we are available to our leaders when they need us, even to the extent something of anticipating uh, the needs of our leaders and doing it before we're, we're asked. And are we submissive and are we teachable? Are we on our own mission? Do we have our own agenda, our own doctrine, our own values, our own vision? If you do, then you're actually not faithful because you can't be entrusted with the vision and the message of the elders because it will be perverted and distorted and, and come through your filter of your own ideology, your own doctrine, your own values and your own vision. As Andrew often says, division simply is die meaning two and vision, two visions is division. I don't know if that makes divorce uh, meaning two sausages, but that's beside the point. We cannot afford division. We need to be a team. And the team of elders and deacons working together to lead God's people, we need to be fast. We need to be faithful, available, submissive, and teachable. 
So to summarize that, basically what we're saying is we need to learn how to work closely together and know each other well. An analogy I often use of the role of deacons is that deacons are rather like the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers in an army. You've got your generals who, uh, who see the big picture and develop the, the strategy. And then in order to attain that strategy, each unit of the army has its own area of responsibility um, that it must fulfill. And you've got the, the corporals and the sergeants in the trenches fighting alongside the guys and who are told, you need to take that hill. And they do everything they can to take that hill. They encourage, they cajole, they threaten, they strategize, they adapt, all of those things. But that will only work if that NCO, if that corporal knows clearly what is expected of him. One of the challenges we have in working of a team is unknowing, is not knowing expectations. So as elders, if, if you're an elder listening to this, the way to work with deacons is to be clear and reasonable uh, in your expectations and get constant feedback um, because that creates security and it creates uh, an environment in which people know what's expected of them, know their area of responsibility, and then they can run with it. In short, the role of an NCO, amongst other things, is to facilitate communication within the command structure. So make sure that that vision, that uh, strategy that the general has is worked down through to every level of the army, that even the, the, the newest private knows what is understood, uh, and knows and understands what is expected of him. And then also to, to communicate back up the command structure uh, to let people know what the state of the troops is, uh, whether the expectations are realistic, whether they can indeed do um, what they've been asked to do, uh, because they can see things that the general can't. The general's usually 50 miles behind the lines uh, and a good general will listen to the guys at the front as well. Ultimately, it's the general's choice uh, but that is the role of the NCO. Armies without good NCOs throughout history have failed. Um, no, the generals get the glory. Everybody's heard of Alexander the Great and Napoleon and Wellington and all of these guys. Um, but while they get the glory, a lot of their success is down to a whole leadership structure from general down to sergeant, uh, helping to unify the troops and make sure that everybody is working towards the same goal and the same strategy and the same vision. So as a deacon working with the elders, I would encourage you to be close, to spend time with, get to know the hearts, get to know them as a people, let them know your heart, be open with them, be honest with them. And then as we know each other, as we know each other's hearts, as we know each other's characters, as we know each other's giftings, also to catch the same vision uh, and the same direction that the church is being led in, and then give yourself as a deacon to making that vision a reality.